everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, we're so glad to have you here. I'm going to just do a couple of quick um, introductions and some welcoming remarks and then we're going to get into our program today. Um, my name is Lisa Guernsey. I am the director of the Teaching, Learning, and Tech program at New America. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I'm here with a number of different colleagues from our Washington, D.C. office at New America. Christina Ishmael, who you'll hear from in a moment. And I'm going to just Big, do a, already a big shout out to Margaret Streeter, who um, is our event coordinator and has been in a lot of the behind the scenes for this. So thank you, Margaret. And she's here from New York. Um, yes, so thanks, Margaret, so much. So what we're going to do um, over the next hour or so is really going to be a lot of fun and also a big experiment for a lot of us, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, at New America, we're a think tank. We're, we're based in a number of different places. I'm from the Washington, D.C. office. We are grappling with these like, big kind of questions and ideas that are hitting a lot of people across communities around our country right now, which is we're being buffeted by a lot of technological change and a lot of social change for good and bad. And we need to kind of think about and process how to make the most of the ideals of of America in terms of liberty and equality and equity while also recognizing the challenges that these technological and social changes mean to all of us. So as we do that, we've been looking at different communities that are really taking some innovative approaches to how to grapple with these problems. And Pittsburgh here is one of those communities. We are really thrilled um, this afternoon and tonight to be able to host this event as part of an ongoing series that we'll be doing in the Pittsburgh and southern, southwestern Pennsylvania region over the next six months. Um, for this particular event, we're going to be we're partnering with the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and Create Lab at CMU, um, and and their ideas were really the have put the, the imprint on this. We're really the basis for um, so much of what we'll talk about tonight. So a big, a big thank you to Laura Roop of the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and, and the whole team at Create Lab. So what we're, what we're doing, and you guys got a taste of that just a minute ago in the earlier, um, in, the, in the room when we were just responding to some prompts, is to try to go deep on what some of the, the questions are that are facing us today, but to do it in a way that's respectful of lots of different people's ideas and thoughts and backgrounds, and to also recognize more of the voices of our youth, um, the ideas that and the energy that's coming from our students today. So before I introduce Laura, who's going to kind of bring us into the discussion, um, I want to just do a big shout out and thanks to some of the other partners who are with us here, um, J.B. Brown and all of his team from the Lighthouse Project at the YMCA, they'll be doing <laughs> fantastic. They'll be doing an audio collage and some work later, um, and so you'll you'll hear a little bit more about that and we'll be part of that at the reception this afternoon. Um, and we also have Steel Town Entertainment um, doing the video for tonight's event and also throughout our entire event series. So huge thanks to Steel Town. Um, for being here and for the whole team um, and what they've been able to put together already for us. And then we also have from, from the A-plus schools the team block, um, several of the students there have been involved in some of our discussions about this, and you'll hear from some of those students um, a little bit later tonight as well. So big thanks to Johnny and others who are here. So I'm now going to introduce Laura, who is going to get us started. Laura Roop is the director of the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project, um, has been a, a thought leader for us on this entire uh, event and um, is the also a professor, assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh and has written a book. I want to make sure I get the title of it correct. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> Drum roll. Doing and Making Authentic Literacies. And this question of what it means to be literate today and how to ensure that our education systems are recognizing the power of technology but also the pitfalls of it is um, a big part of the conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Laura, and thank you again. Thank you so much, um, and welcome to the uh, Fannie Edel Falk Laboratory School, which is the lab school for University of Pittsburgh. Um, I really want to thank the folks at Falk School, so uh, Jill Serrata and Jeff Suzik 
um, who were the leaders of the school, as well as many of the staff. They have been wonderfully warm and welcoming to um, the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project. For the last five summers, they have hosted us as we offer our Summer Institute and our Teachers as Thinkers workshops here at Falk. Um, and we're just so grateful they're willing to s share their space with the educators from around the, the city. Um, we're really excited about this event and all of the partners involved, um, from New America to the Create Lab to Steeltown Educa um, Entertainment and the Lighthouse Project. Um, we're just eager to open up new conversations and ask questions about relationships between arts, humanities, and technologies. Our ongoing collaboration with the Create Lab has taught us that if we can be brave enough to dig into unfamiliar topics together across our differences and ground our conversations in inquiry, compassion, authenticity, and agency, we can get glimpses of what Martin Luther King Jr. referred to as the beloved community. Um, last year, a study group um, uh, was put together by the Create Lab and the Writing Project exploring artificial intelligence, ethics, and education. And we asked questions like this. Are we training machines to be like humans or humans to be like machines or both? And who is being left out of big data? We learned that just as in politics, we citizens could not expect technologists to sit with the ethical complexities of new technologies without us. Um, so how can we create these spaces to speak and listen and learn across these differences um, in role, in expertise, in culture, in history, in background, and in power? Um, today we're really excited to explore with what Nicole Mira terms critical civic empathy as we consider education's role in the world um, that is r now full of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, in her book, Educating for Empathy, Dr. Mira argues that um, students should be doers and makers. They should be writers. They should be debaters, researchers, and public actors. For Nicole Mira, empathy is not merely kindness or niceness that individuals express. Instead, critical civic empathy begins by looking at social position, power, and privilege um, of all the parties involved focusing on ways personal experiences matter in public life, and fostering democratic dialogue and civic action committed to equity and justice. Um, Nicole is an assistant professor of urban teacher education at Rutgers University. Um, and she began her career as an English teacher working in urban schools, including the New York City schools. Her research focuses on um, the intersections between critical literacy and civic engagement with urban students and teachers across classroom, community, and digital learning. Um, Nicole will be in dialogue with Christina Ishmael, who is the senior project manager for the New America's Teaching, Learning, and Tech program. And Christina has taught English language learners in Nebraska, has worked for the Nebraska Department of Ed, and served as a K-12 Open Education Fellow at the U.S. Department of Education in the Office of Ed Tech. So we're really delighted for this conversation to proceed. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> really? <laughs> Hi, everyone. OK, that's better. <laughs> How are you all doing? OK, that was good, too. All right. Welcome to Pittsburgh. I'm not from here, but it's nice to be here. <laughs> Actually, neither one of us. I'm falling in love with the city already. Yeah. It's really beautiful and amazing, and today's a beautiful day. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first reaction the first time I came, too. So I was like, ah, Pittsburgh, you've got it going on. Um, so we are delighted to be uh, having a conversation for the next 15 minutes. We could talk for a lot longer. We just met face to face about an hour ago. However, in preparation for this event, I found out that we are connected by many people. And it just goes to show you how small the universe is, as well as how small the world of education is, and that we are all connected. And it's pretty cool if you think about it. So um, we could go, again, in all sorts of different places, I think. Are we OK? Yeah, I'm OK. We want to make sure we're heard. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we could go in all sorts of directions as far as our conversation is concerned. But uh, we will start right away. 
uh, with something that you wrote, an article called From Digital Consumption to Digital Invention. And it's toward a new critical theory and practice of multiliteracies. Also, I'm referring to notes on my phone. I'm not on Twitter, I promise. <laughs> Although we both are on Twitter. Love the Twitter. And there are our handles. Um, so so I, I want to root this in something that I'm really familiar with, which is the US Department of Education has an office, the Office of Ed Tech, the one that I used to work in. And it is congressionally mandated for them to create something called the National Ed Tech Plan. And this is a lighthouse document for the country to talk about ed tech. Mm -hmm. And the newest version was put out in 2016, written by a dear friend of mine, Zach Chase, and with the help of educators from all across the country. And they identify five different areas, learning, teaching, uh, leadership, uh, infrastructure, and assessment. Those are the five. See, it's testing oh, really my knowledge it. to see if I remember it. <laughs> um, but there are, it's really a vision of equity, active use, and collaborative leadership to make everywhere all the time learning. And so there's this one graphic that I like to refer to a lot. Uh, we have the digital divide, whether we have access from, from school to home, but there's also this digital use divide, which is we have kids that consume a lot and they're passively using technology. Um, but then we have a call for active use of technology and then identify some different ways that you can actively use that. So in your, in your article that I referred to, um, you outlined a critical theory that addresses a similar issue. Can you tell us more about that and why that's important? Sure, and <laughs> thanks again for having me to New America and to the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project. I'm a Writing Project fellow. I'm a teacher. That's where I come to this work from. Um, writing Project! Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> And I'll say first, like I think for many of you that are in the classroom, uh, when I was a teacher, it was kind of the beginning of the, of the adoption of technology on a large scale. Yeah. And I've been really fascinated because when I talk to teachers around the country, I've found that a lot of times we think of these, uh, uh, these shiny devices as having some kind of like innate magical power of their own. That if you bring them into the classroom, they're going to like magically transform learning somehow without realizing that they're a tool to be used by the human beings for the purposes that we create. And so I see schools where administrators uh, want to evaluate teachers by the technology has to be out and has to be being used. We don't know why or how, but mm. somehow as long as they're on an iPad, that means that some kind of learning is happening. Hmm. And as teachers, we know that that's not necessarily true. So I wanted to get more into what is this difference between passive and active use and maybe go even further than that. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this article with my dear mentor, Ernest Morell, who's a giant in the field of literacy studies. Many of us know him. And we've been thinking for years now about how this article came out in 1996 by this group called the New London Group. It was a group of researchers that got together in 1996 and think about where technology was then. Yeah. And they said, you know what? We've got to change the way we think about literacy. We've got to change the way we think about learning. And it's been over 20 years now. And we wanted to come back and say, well, how should our theory of learning change knowing what we know now about technology? And I think we would argue that, yes, most use of technology that is being uh, promoted by tech companies is around engagement on a passive basis because that's what benefits uh, the stats and that's what creates profit for technology companies. And I think a lot of times the, the talk that we have around how do we use technology, how can we be more active, sometimes doesn't get to that critical space of saying, well, who's dictating the terms of how we use these platforms? Mm -hmm. Twitter and the folks that create Twitter, even if I think that I'm composing original and amazing tweets, my expression is being couched within and kind of determined by a corporate platform mm -hmm. and they are benefiting from my communication and my speech. How do we help un young people understand that and take more agency and more critique over the ways that their data and their voice are being used so that they can then kind of flip the script in the system. So in the article we talk about how yes, we, we do need critical consumption of media. We need students to understand where media comes from, who owns it, who owns their data, what privacy looks like. Yes, we need them to also create. Mm -hmm by creating their own media, but then we need to move forward into the steps of distribution of their own media. So how do we make sure youth voices are being mm -hmm. heard across the public sphere? Not simply in the ways that capitalistic comp companies want their voices to be heard, but sometimes in protest or in agitation against how they're treated. And then the final step we try to argue for is digital invention. So how would young people be able to start hacking, creating new forms of media that speak to their own interests as opposed to the interests of the folks that are creating a lot of the technology on the big data scale. So for example, if folks aren't familiar with, um, it used to be called Youth Radio and now it's called YR Media out of Oakland, California. It's an amazing nonprofit and I know there's nonprofits all over the country doing this kind of great work where young people are creating uh, apps of their own. These apps can start from very personal 
kind of service learning space where like I know young people have created apps about finding someone to sit with in the cafeteria. Yeah. And that's great. And then there's apps around like how to help help you record interactions with the police. And that's getting a lot more into the kind of critical kind of social action that I'm really interested in. And then there's young people looking at gentrification in their communities and they're using technology to reimagine how they would want the storefronts to be transformed into community spaces that would benefit them and their families. So I think encouraging young people to not simply interact with media on the terms of those adults that create it for them, that treat them as objects, and rather young people becoming the subjects who can take what is being given to them and then kind of flipping it and remixing it and transforming it for their own purposes to speak out against injustice and to speak for their communities. That's what I'm really passionate about. Can you all tell? <laughs> I'm like, ah. See, we could talk, talk for longer than 15 minutes. Yeah, so do I. It's fine. I have the, the little bangles, too. Um, so that actually lends itself to my next question, um, which is really rooted in your book, Educating for Empathy. And I've, I've been studying with this since I read it. And it's come up in a lot of conversations since then with educators and non-educators. And I'm like, hey, have you heard of this whole thing, um, critical civ civic empathy? And they're like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but I was also just with teachers in Cleveland over the past three days, and there's this big push for SEL. SEL this, SEL that, that social emotional learning. And that we want kids to develop their non-cognitive skills, and we want them to be, or the soft skills, whatever, whatever you may call it. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily buzzwordy. I mean, it's buzzwordy now, yeah. but it's something that we've always done as educators, is that we've helped cultivate that in our students. Um, tell us a little bit, well, I have the definition, mm -hmm. but tell us in your words. Uh, what, how you define this. Sure, and I don't think it's a mistake that our interest in social emotional learning is re-peaking at a time when we're worried about cyberbullying, the hate speech online, echo chambers, the negative divisive rhetoric that's happened in the wake of the 2016 presidential election. I don't think it's a mistake, because it tends to be that whenever there are social problems, we, t we turn to the schools, we turn to educators to solve those problems. We're not simply there, we never were there for simply academic learning. We've always been there for more than that. Uh, and so what I've been curious about for a long time, I've always found empathy to be a really fascinating and really powerful characteristic. Like what an amazing thing to try to get inside the mind or try to see the world through the eyes of people who are different than us. And I really do still believe that that is the most powerful competency that we have to try to get past the division that we see in society. I think it's one of our only hopes is empathy. But I get a little worried when in popular culture, empathy is kind of portrayed as this kind of tolerance or niceness or there's that expression, put yourself in someone else's shoes, which is great, but I, when I think about my shoes, I wear very simple shoes. And I don't <laughs> think it's so simple as taking on or putting on off a pair of shoes. For me, as a cisgender, heterosexual, white, middle-class woman, yeah. to imagine the world through the eyes of someone who is experiencing police brutality or is from a minoritized community in this country, it takes a lot of work to do that well. And if, it's not, if you don't do that work, it just stays at a surface level and we just kind of talk about how we're all human beings, which is true. At some level, we are all global citizens. We are all part of the human family. But we know that that's not the way that life is experienced in our social context. That there are issues of power. There are issues of privilege. There are systemic inequities in our society. So it's not simply so simple as to say, like, let's all just like, get along. Right? We need to go a little deeper to understand why power manifests itself in certain ways. And if I truly want to understand what life is like through another person's perspective, it takes a lot of like, personal excavation of my own mm -hmm. privilege. It takes true dialogue and communication. It takes moving past a lot of the surface narratives that we have. So my idea of critical civic empathy is just the critical part is understanding power, privilege, inequity, how that plays out in democracy. And the civic part is if we have empathy, but we don't use it to change how we act in the world to create a better democracy, if it doesn't change how we vote or how we treat our neighbors, or how we solve problems in our communities, then what's the point of empathy hmm. if we're not using it to create a more just society? So the book is basically about trying to figure out in educational spaces with young people, how can we use literacy to foster not just surface level empathy, but a more critical and civic form of empathy. And that's, I think, th it's an aspirational goal. I don't, think, I don't think I'm there, and I don't think any of us, we're all trying to kind of move towards that in our practice as much as possible. Yeah. So this is not on our questions, but this is, it just spurred something. So I have a, a really good friend who is a digital media teacher in St. Louis. We've kind of talked about this a little mm -hmm. bit um, and was teaching in a high school setting when Ferguson happened. Mm -hmm. And he empowered his students, um, mostly students of color, to start to ask questions 
and dig into this. Um, and they leveraged the power of the digital media that they were learning about and then applied that in specific projects and then got out there and, and started asking questions of their community and of their neighborhoods. Um, do you have any other examples that you can share of, of similar projects or what you're seeing across the country when it comes to like that active use of technology? So it's, it's marrying the, the technology, but also with this idea yeah. of the, the critical civic empathy. Yeah, and that's where I see kind of speaking to one of the chalk talks about like what is digital citizenship, yeah. I see that kind of project is what I would want digital citizenship curricula to be focused on. Mm. Whereas I think a lot of digital citizenship curriculum starts from a place of risk and danger and Don't protection. Don't share your password. Yeah, like <laughs> I see posts from folks like, show my students how many times this will get shared around the world and how nothing you put on the internet is safe, mm. which I don't d discount how important that is. There are, there are serious issues to talk about there, but if that's the limit of it, there's so much we're missing of how technology can create those connections across perspectives like we've never been able to do before. Mm. So there's stories like that. I'm, I'm involved in a project right now with the National Writing Project. I've got six National Writing Project teachers from across the country, from Alaska to Philadelphia, cool. uh, who have been using digital platforms to connect their students to talk about the civic issues that matter to them across their different contexts. So uh, it turns out we did, we've got over 300 students involved in this project. Uh, this issue that they wanted to talk about the most right now that affects them, not surprisingly, is gun issues. Mm. And, but it's been really fascinating to see how that issue is playing out differently based on the social context that they're coming from. The way that students in Philadelphia are experiencing guns is very different than the students who are in Anchorage, Alaska, or in Aurora, Colorado, or in Detroit, Michigan, or in Dallas, Texas. And so it's been fascinating for the young people to, to think about what their, what their civic values are and what their, how their perspectives might change on how they have dialogue with folks who are different from them. In an educational and loving and pedagogical space, which I think is really powerful. But the flip side of it is that I often talk to just as many teachers who want to do this kind of work, but because of the rhetoric we have around fear uh, or closed off, we need schools to be protected spaces, they don't want them to go online to ask questions or to do research about controversial issues because they don't know how administrators are going to react or family members are going to react or community. So there's many teachers that, and students that want to talk about this stuff, but they need the support of the administrators and the communities around them to support them to do this and to remember that public education was meant to be a space to see different ideas, not for us to be clients who only get what we want and can reject what we don't want. And I've also seen that when young people speak up and often do research, adults want them to be civically engaged until they start asking questions that adults feel uncomfortable about and then they don't want them to be civically engaged anymore. Mm. So there are students in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> we can stop for that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There are students in Philadelphia and it can be even something as small as like there's a trip that's a ski trip that would happen in the school district of Philadelphia for the school every year. It was canceled. Students were given no information why. The teachers were given no information why. And they were journalism students who had just learned about the Freedom of Information Act. Yes. And so they, this is an authentic use, oh, yeah. Of, yeah, like, authentic <laughs> use of learning. They wanted to go and ask, why did this happen? Why is the school that's across the city that has a lot more resources and more affluent students, why do they keep their trip and we don't? And literally, like, their principal, was, they were getting phone calls like, stop your kids from doing this. this is and I think that leads to a lot of questions for me of how much do we really want young people's voices to be heard? Um, and I think that kind of agitation and interrogation of the system is what I think is more important than just participating in the structures we already have, which is what I get worried about with a lot of traditional curriculum is just kind of like, do better with what we give you to accept that this is the system there is and work within that system, as opposed to appreciating when young people really want to start shaking things up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time. We've got two yeah, minutes. Uh, you know, no big deal. Um, we are in a city that is dealing with, well, you have a lot of um, technology companies. Um, the theme of this event is around automation, artificial intelligence. Uh, I was at ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education, their annual conference in Philly a few weeks ago, and their opening keynote speaker was a futurist, and he looked like a magician, just so you know. Ooh, um, I but, ideas and I also want that title. <laughs> That's really made up. It's awesome. Um, he talked a lot about AI and education. There were also a lot of sessions, how to use Amazon Echo in a classroom, and I have some serious concerns over that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we are we are challenged by this. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? In one minute, <laughs> <laughs> this kind of speaks to the chalk talk that was out there. If companies have a profit imperative, how does that intersect with the public good? Mm -hmm. And how do we have oversight over the way that these things are being used? I get very nervous around the amount of millions of dollars that are being spent around the idea of 21st century skills and 21st century learning when we don't have a clear definition of what that term actually means mm -hmm. or what 
skills that students need in the 21st century that are any different than what they needed in the 20th or 19th century. If what we truly have always been after is authentic student voice, connection, empathy, those are eternal skills and they're not gonna be bought by any kind of tool. Mm -mm. It's something that is about the, the pedagogy and the, and the connection. And I, I don't know if it needs to be, I do think that technology companies need to like, you know, hire national writing projects to kind of tell them what's what <laughs> <laughs> and kind of speak to the idea like we need educators in these rooms where decisions are being made uh, as opposed to them being seen as the buyers yep. that of what technology companies are selling how do we actually move into a more critical friends kind of partnership where there could be some real difficult dialogue <laughs> so my friend Zach and I had a conversation about the, the terminology critical friends um, those are the friends that you don't want to invite to brunch <laughs> Uh, so we called them provocateurs. Mm, so like provoking thought and, yeah. and asking those those tough questions. Um, I really appreciate your <laughs> thoughts on that. Also, what do you think about, um, I'm asking another question, uh, <laughs> what do you think of the idea that teachers can be replaced by robots and the automation? I have lots of thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like it's almost, it's watching the failures that happen when we try these experiments are almost finally making some people open their eyes to the fact that teaching is a human complex endeavor that is cannot never be mechanized it can never yeah. be digitized mm -hmm. and i think that it shouldn't have to come to these kinds of experiments for us to understand that but the idea that any tool that needs to be used has to be taken into account with students individual identities their cultural identities mm -hmm. the social context in which we're in the intersection between teachers beliefs and practices and larger st structures that they're working in like none of this exists in isolation and none of it can all be accounted for by algorithms we are more complex than than an algorithm and i yeah. think that i get worried uh, but at the same time i worry because our public schooling system as we see through accountability systems standardized testing is trying to also it almost seems like they're trying to converge because if the only point that we care about is transmission of isolated facts and knowledge, then technology probably can do some of that. Mm -hmm. And if all we want is students to re regurgitate factual information on a test, and we want to use AI to grade student writing and make writing in kind of a, a dead, mechanized, kind of computerized process, and in some ways that, that could work. And that's even more scary to me is if we don't recognize it coming, uh, we're going to lose more of our agency in the process and, and we'll see more and more generations of students after No Child Left Behind mm -hmm. who are coming out without the kinds of critical thinking and creative skills that we know that they need to navigate a complex changing world that has problems that we don't even know the kinds of skills we're gonna need to tackle them yet. That kind of learning is not gonna help us ch to, to figure out what to do with those challenges. Yeah, okay. So uh, the next part of this is that Nicole has provided us with three big questions or the big three um, it's in kind of small print, sorry. Um, and I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, so you all have the chance to read that. But I would love for you to take in these three questions and then uh, give it a few moments to think about it, but then turn and talk to a neighbor nearby. Uh, what are your initial thoughts, reactions, or kind of questions that you might have around these big three? We're gonna go into a facilitated um, Q&A kind of session after this but we wanted to now put these three uh, questions in your hands for the next few moments. Would you like me to read them? Are you good? Okay. Turn and talk, find a neighbor. <laughs>
questions that I've had was sorry you're good uh, I did have a question I was writing questions but That's it right. was more of just like mm -hmm. repeat the question oh mm -hmm. um, uh, why don't like adults let kids like mm. like go off on their own and do what they want? And I actually kind of had to answer that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you said, so, yeah, tell us. Yeah, tell us. Yeah. <laughs> I think it goes back to what you were saying about how students and teachers and sometimes the administration are afraid to step up and uh, try to like advocate for themselves and their students. I think right now that is a big problem because. I know within my school, like a lot of the teachers are like 
well, we can't do that because of this, that, and a third. And even now in my class, we were talking about how not every student has the same needs, and, and it's about equity. Mm -hmm. But the tutor told me, well, I'm not being paid enough to be a teacher. I'm a tutor. And mm -hmm. I feel like that was also a problem. I feel like people within a system shouldn't always settle for the job that they have. They should want to work towards, uh, like, having the position where you get to structure the way this program is because you will sit there and complain about how this structure isn't right, but then you won't get up and do something about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> Everyone snap for that. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Um, Roberta, where are you? There you are. All right. Roberta, you have a history in early childhood. Did anything resonate with you from that lens, or are you going to ask or have other thoughts? Well, I, actually, a dozen things <laughs> were resonating <laughs> that we were talking about. Um, but one of one of my struggles is that we um, often, in the early years especially, end up talking about the devices or the material instead of the pedagogy. Mm. Like, how would we use this? Yeah. And I, one of the questions I have is, how do we how do we get that conversation centered back on what is the learning that occurs rather than what's the newest and latest? Um, mm. so I don't know if you have thoughts about that. And then I have a second part of that, so. Yeah. Um, I think that's really powerful, and I often get, the, there's another part of, we, we didn't even get to talk about youth research. We talked a little bit about yeah. young people yeah. developing questions about things they care about and then using technology to the go out and maybe interview elders in their community, collect mm -hmm. data, and represent it the way they want to represent it to right. tell their story. And every time we talk about this work, I've mostly done it with middle and high school students. So people come up to me and say, that's great and all, but like elementary school kids can't do this. And we, yes, know, they that can. yes, they can. <laughs> we know that they can. And like, we, we know that young people understand what's going on around them and have questions about what's, about what's going on mm -hmm. around them fr from a very young age. And oftentimes they are more like justice warriors and more idealistic in their solutions than we are because we lose that as we get older, sadly. Yeah. So I, I find a yeah. lot of hope in the youngest among us to have yeah. that kind of equity lens. And I feel like I can give stories of like first grade teachers that have been able to engage in kind of inquiry work and writing to journalists who are writing stories about things going on in their town and utilizing technology for a meaningful purpose. And so I think, I think some of it starts with encouraging teachers to make sure that they are fully committed to what the potential is of their students and what they're capable of. And then not thinking, I, and I'm always, I'm always telling teachers to think about the pedagogical goal mm -hmm. and then figure out what technology you need to make that goal happen. Mm -hmm. And for, it might just be paper and pencil. The connected learning is not always yeah. about technology. Mm -hmm. It's about using what you need to use yeah. to accomplish the goal <laughs> that you have. <laughs> we know. And so, and if it, but it is true that technology can then connect young people across time and space in ways that we've never experienced before. So I think there are often powerful things that can be done. But I think it's, it's, it's really, I mean, and it gets back to what Johnny was saying about like, do we truly believe that young people care about like, these issues and do we truly believe in what they can do? And we say that we do in rhetoric and, and we don't often back that up with our actions. And mm -hmm. if we're truly gonna, I think it takes a little stepping back about what our purpose is and how we really feel about young people in this country and what they're, how powerful they are and how their voices need to be heard. They don't need to be empowered. They, are, they just need to be given the microphone. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that helps even with the youngest students for me I, is to get back to that yeah. like, what do I want my students to explore? And then, like, I don't care what this range of new cool apps are. Yeah. <laughs> Only so much as it's gonna help me accomplish a goal that I know my students need, hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. That's a great, great idea. Can I squeeze another little sure. one in? <laughs> yeah, um, we'll allow. And, and th this has to do how we change attitudes about what learning is. Mm. Um, because my frustration in the preschools is that so often, um, people become enamored with what I call animated worksheets at a time <laughs> when we wouldn't give children pencil paper worksheets yeah. as a teaching tool. Yeah. And yet somehow the belief that these um, animated worksheets are going to communicate are going to ha help children learn. And so the frustration I find is um, how to get people to understand that, that it has to be developmentally appropriate when we introduce it. And that I loved your examples. There are ways that we can use technology in, in developmentally appropriate ways, and it's not worksheets. 
So yeah. I, any other yeah. ideas? Yeah. Any engagement that? is not learning. They're they are connected, but they are not exactly the same thing. I things. worry that too many of the programs are about being like shiny oh. and moving things uh -huh. around, so and so the kids are like visually drawn in. But are they following up with a th true theory of learning that are leading that's leading them to somewhere important? And if not, then it's just shiny for no reason, with no depth. And so that's why I worry about sometimes that's not needed for the kinds of deep conver and sustained conversations that need to be had. But there are some ways, again, it's the same kind of thing we've been talking about. There are ways that the tools can be harnessed by us, but we're letting them harness us right now. We're letting the tools harness us instead of us harnessing them. Yeah. I just have to do a, a shameless plug for my director, Lisa Guernsey, and her book, Tap, Click, Read, as well. Um, a great resource, if you are not familiar with this, um, to talk more about uh, technology in the early years. So that is something that may, you may find useful. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say what? Tap, click, read. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> the author's right here. <laughs> um, now we have a high school ELA teacher. Um, Amy, where are you? Oh. From one high school ELA teacher to another, Yay. that is Nicole. Yay! Hi, I'm um, Amy from Annie. I at Lieber Area High School and I'm here with the uh, writing project as well and I just I love your work I love what you're doing yeah. and um, I really appreciate the opportunity that these digital platforms offer us to foster empathy inquiry responsiveness um, and I'm interested in hearing if you could speak a little more to what you're doing with those six yeah. uh, writing project <laughs> schools, especially with regards to overcoming the barriers to get these different communities to uh, communicate. I teach in a, a pretty homogenous district, and I think something like this would be invaluable. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're in the process, and I should say that um, in September, October, uh, we are putting resources onto the current, which is the National Writing Project's network of sharing resources. So everything that we're doing in the 3D project, we call it 3D, Digital Democratic Dialogue Project. And so all of the teachers are gonna be publishing blogs and we're gonna be putting all of our curriculum resources online for all teachers to use. Yay! So that's coming <laughs> soon, as soon as we can. Um, this project was originally funded by the Spencer Foundation, which is important to say, because they were able to give us some seed money to um, allow me to visit all six of the communities around the country. Uh, and for us to explore the kinds of platforms that we could use for people to connect. And we did have, we have some very um, homogenous kind of communities, and then we have much more diverse communities. We have communities that were all about learning from others. We have others that were much more closed and that administrators were having a hard time uh, letting students get online and talk. But it's, I really can't, I, I mean, I wish I could, we're gonna talk more over time about the amazing kind of like moments of growth and moments of change where young people were exposed to someone outside of themselves. I don't want to tell the whole story for her, but Janelle Bentz, who's an amazing writing project fellow um, in Texas, uh, has a story about students of hers who, uh, they have a shooting club at their school, speaks to a little bit about different cultures around guns in different places. Hmm. Um, and the student just kind of couldn't imagine why anyone would have a different opinion than he wow. did about guns. Like he had learned from his family, learned hmm. from his community, and. I think we need to acknowledge that sometimes there's, there could be a process of loss or pain in kind of hearing a perspective that's different than what you've been taught as part of your family identity and your community. That's a really serious learning that has to go on. He's in that grade. Uh, I spoke to a student in Philadelphia who had had a friend who was a victim of gun violence. And after that, just having a Zoom call and being able to see a student who was different than him and talk through that issue, he left that conversation kind of thinking like, wow, like how, did, how was I able to have this view this whole time and never know there could be someone out there who's like my age and just like me in some ways, but has such a different experience. And does it change their entire political philosophy in a moment? No, but I think those, those moments of, of critical civic empathy, those moments of, um, you know, we know that developmentally, teenagers are very much, you know, kind of narcissistic and in their own worlds in some ways, but at the same time also craving to reach out. And as much as we have residential segregation and school segregation in this country, it's never gonna be enough to just do these programs within our schools because there's oftentimes too much, like we're saying, hom homogeneity. So sometimes digital technology is one of the best tools we have to break out of the bubbles that we've been put into by years and years of redlining and other policies. So I really have a lot of hope for the ways that technology can be used in transformative ways for that kind of connection. And the ways that teachers, we met every month, it became a teacher inquiry group that really became a group of healing and a group of how to navigate restrictive policies that are often trying to turn teachers off from having these hard conversations. Mm -hmm. The teachers feel like this is the real work, like we're seeing, this is like the real human work of helping young people to become citizens. It's really powerful. 
it's really cool. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait to read about this. Uh, and lastly, we have Jason um, from the STEM Coding Lab. Hello, uh, my name is Jason. I'm the program director for STEM Coding Lab, and I looked at the third prompt and also something that you said about elementary students, because that's where we focus, and they very much can do it. We, we just did it. So uh, we, uh, we ran an HTML camp for kids going into fourth and kids going into fifth grade, where that they learned HTML and CSS skills while also developing a web page about the neighborhood that they live in. Uh, Pittsburgh is a very much a uh, community of neighborhoods. And the students that we worked with at Summer Dreamers Academy typically are, live in the neighborhoods that are saw on the news as gang violence and, and drugs and, and just a violence altogether. And we wanted to give them a voice and show the positive parts of their neighborhoods. And uh, I think that is, uh, they did a really nice job with it. Uh, Lisa was there, she can attest to that. But the, um, I just wanted to see, the, the ask, where do you see, by the time they get to fifth grade, what is an ideal amount of knowledge they need, in your opinion? And it can vary from a suburban school to an urban school. Urban school, the, 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 they have very little um, resources. But what, in an ideal world, in an urban setting, what, what, by fifth grade, what should they be, do you think they should be really, their skill level should be? I mean, in terms of tech skill and Tech skill and, yeah, being able to integrate tech into their learning. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think it goes to the authentic purpose. I think young people at, in fifth grade, I wouldn't even put it in terms of, I guess I wouldn't even think of the tech first. I think, what do I think fifth graders are capable of? I think fifth graders are capable of really complex analysis of their identities, of their communities, of what adults think they're capable of. I think they can represent that in writing. I think they can represent that with their voices. Mm -hmm. I think they can collaborate. And so I think that if those are the things I believe that fifth graders can do, then I think that it's only like the, the capability of teaching them how to use a certain tool, like kids can pick that up like nothing. That's not even right. the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is whether we ever give them the chance to develop the, the actual skills of collaboration. If we let them raise their voices, if we let them fail an experiment and we get beyond the test prep curriculum for them to actually have those cycles of inquiry, then I think they can master any of the tools that would allow you to do that online. Like I really believe that it's not about the like, do they have to be coding? I always say coding for what? Like, I, I think coding is important, but not as an isolated skill. If it's just a neoliberal, like, you should learn these tech skills because it'll help you get a job, for me, that's not enough. Like, it, what does it mean? And also, it's gonna keep them in the mode of just being the objects of the tech, rather than true subjects of truly understanding the ins and outs of who's created it, how it works. So uh, to, for me, I'm not as concerned if a fifth grader in one school knows how to code and a fifth grader in another school doesn't, but if they both know how to raise their voices and engage mm -hmm. community around inquiry, then I'm happy. And because the, the tech stuff can come. Like we, uh, many of us are all learning different, I still don't know how to use certain things and I'm still learning. When kids have an authentic and meaningful purpose to use it, they will learn it. I don't, you can't mic drop a lab, but I think that was it right there, like boom. And we can go to the reception, okay. Um, no, actually we do have about uh, 10 minutes to open it up to anyone now on the floor. Yes, we've got a question already. I, I just wanna say, cause a lot of this feels a little odd because, well, I, I did go to Harrisburg last month to learn about computer science. And we do have in Pennsylvania a framework uh, for computer science that is pretty good, uh, that includes areas that I didn't think were computer science. Mm. And so I think when you're saying once, I mean, to me, when you that comment you just made was kind of weird because I do think it matters. I mean, we do have standards and a framework, and I think it's important to stay within that. And there's a, a PhD person there who is very nerdy and is working on putting every little piece of linked possible cur like curriculum support with it. So I think if people could just commit to reading that framework mm. and to working within it, um, that would be a really good first step. That's what me as a not a computer science teacher uh, thought was what I got out of that. Uh, just actually reading the framework and working within it. And then we don't, you know, it, it, it isn't okay if somebody in the suburbs can code and then somebody in a higher poverty school doesn't have that skill set, that's not okay. Mm. Okay, so if we work with our framework and work with our state standards, I think that would really help. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Who else? I taught kindergarten. I've got really good wait time. Uh, <laughs> You're all thinking of that reception? Really? Really? 
Yeah? You got one back there? Oh, Michelle's got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really, I love the way you talk about empathy because really I feel like it's actually actionable and that makes it compassion because it's just not enough to feel something, but what does it mean to actually be in, in practice? But I'm really interested in um, what are the new narratives that unite us? The American dream is an old story, mm. doesn't work, but what is the thing that um, is the aspirational thing that we should reach for as a people? So mm -hmm. when we think about what will be the nature of work, what will be the nature of being together? Because if we're really doing this right, we're going to remake how we are in society together. Mm -hmm. Will we, or will our neighborhoods be the same? Mm -hmm. Will we um, be in discourse differently for really doing it? So what are, this may be prefigurative work, but like what are the new narratives that should be driving us, um, kind of our North Star in this work? Yeah, that's funny. I was just talking to Christina about some like, some of the deep philosophical challenges that the students have been grappling with through this 3D project. Uh, when they, because one of the last design cycles that we did was, um, imagining a civic future, and we wanted them to be as crazy and creative as they wanted to be. Uh, they did Some of them developed like civic superheroes uh, and developed origin stories for them, and just went like off crazy, not even having to worry about whether it was realistic or not, just what they imagined the civic future to be, and what kind of, sort of skills we're gonna need to, to live with each other in community in the future. And part of me gets really sad because I think um, young people, more than ever, have a really like, I think, I'm really interested in speculative, like science fiction right now, Afrofuturism. Afro young people are looking to their future and they see that our world is being destroyed. They're worried about climate change. They're worried about continued inequity. They're worried about gun violence. They're worried about polarization. And when they look to the future, they have a pretty, in some ways, pessimistic view of what adults are willing to do to support them on their journey. Uh, but at the same time, they also have hope. And where that hope comes from is not necessarily based in any nation state or even global citizens. It's really about like kind of an indigenous idea of like being in relation with each other. Like they, the, where they find hope is in those little moments, like the little moment that a student had of having that breakthrough about, uh, he was in relation for a moment with a student, uh, another human being unlike himself. Mm -hmm. And I think what they see when they get worried about the bigness of the system and whether there's hope on, the, on big scales, they start to look to the only hope being us being in better relation with each other and with the land than we have been before. And that's as far as I've been able to get, I'm still like processing what that means because in some ways it breaks my heart, but in other ways it kind of makes me believe that young people are the most, you know, they're the most powerful and most social justice warriors that I could imagine. And so I feel like there has to be something there about us breaking down some of the traditional hierarchies of how we, and like you're saying, how neighborhoods are constructed, how workplaces are constructed to be more in relation with each other. And what that, I don't know what that means yet in practice, but that's where we're, that's where the young people are leading us, I think. We were talking while you all were having uh, your chance to talk. The, I, in New America, we have a lot of millennials. Um, I qualify as an elder millennial. Um, <laughs> we also discussed that, that we both qualify as elder millennials. And there is that blame that's kind of put on millennials, like, oh, like those millennials. I'm like, actually, all the millennials that I've worked with are pretty amazing and are pretty like, well in tune with things like inequities and social justice. And when you talk about some of these students that you've worked with and, and within the projects, I'm also not really worried about Gen Z. Like our current generation of students that we have right now, they, yeah, if we continue to cultivate this as well um, and not letting the automation or the AI or the technologies kind of take over, but that we have the power to, uh, to kind of help drive that. Um, hey, students in the room. Hey, students, hi. Hey, you have a room full of like educators in the room. You have any thoughts for us? No, really? Just like a high school classroom, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. No, no other thought, no? Sorry, I totally put you on the spot. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Greg, you had your hand? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, we have a room full of educators, and educators are among the, if not most trusted source of support and information for parents, families, and caregivers. Mm. And in our brief conversation, we were talking about the challenge as parents navigating all of this, because there's a danger that a parent either hears 
technology can solve everything or technology bad, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's obviously much more nuanced than that. And we benefit significantly in, um, in states across the country with frameworks like you described in terms of work that state departments of education mm -hmm. are doing in all sorts of peer learning networks like the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and dozens of others. And educators are um, wonderfully, you know, probably 12 steps ahead <laughs> in terms of thinking about this um, as compared to parents who are just not, uh, you know, the parents in the room will appreciate it. We're just navigating 10,000 mm -hmm. things. So as educators, where are you turning for very practical resources, mm -hmm. practical support so that when that parent comes in, with that email, with that phone call in the few minutes during open house, like tell me the five places I can turn. Okay, I turn to common sense. Mm -hmm. Where else can I turn? Mm -hmm. um, how are you navigating that in support for parents? Mm -hmm. I was trying to really just tell the teachers in my study are relating to their, their parents. Since I'm not working with, I'm working with undergraduates now instead of K-12. Um, and I feel like in a lot of ways, teachers need to and my teachers have taken it upon themselves to be, educate themselves across all these different sites so that they can speak, because the, the people that, it's about relationships of trust. Mm -hmm. Like, they can send their parents to certain websites, but that's not really gonna assuage the fears that a parent has. They know that the teacher knows their child, and if there's a, a level of trust there, and they know that the teacher is looking out for the best interests and in how they use technology in their schools, that's why I think all the parents have been happy to be part of this weird study where they're getting their kids online to talk across platforms. <laughs> We've had like, you know, We've had to do some things about privacy and keep ourselves on closed social networks in some ways because of issues of privacy and working in technology in schools. But we've used, we've used all of those as teaching moments and explained all of it to the parents in detail so that they don't feel like they're in the dark or that they're just kind of being, like, like just, tr just trust us. Like, I don't want it to be just trust us, we know what we're doing. But I also don't want it to be like, look at X, Y, and Z. I think it has to be a more relational, contextual thing. That's what I've seen working so far. Uh, and that also puts pressure on teachers because obviously we don't have time in our days to like go and like become experts uh, about every like in and out of screen time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think there needs to be kind of combined inquiry within school districts before we spend, like there's millions of dollars being spent and curriculum frameworks are being transformed. And I think if that was done in a more research practice partnership kind of way in which all stakeholders were brought to a table to talk through it together. I think everyone would feel a lot more comfortable with the results that came about. So I think that's where some of the research is going next is about like truly collaborative research so that everyone feels like they're getting what they need out of the conversation. Are there any educators that want to help answer Greg's question too? Like what are some of the, the sources that you go to? I see a hand, Amy. I, I, okay, sorry. I found a helpful way to go about this is to teach the students and have them create a resource to share with their parents. So I've had them, um, after we've gone over everything from echo chambers and um, the filter bubble and you know different, um, different kinds of media, then I have them create a project to share with the parents and that's been helpful. So that's been one way. Mm -hmm. Creation. Okay, so uh, uh, when we when we broke up into groups, um, we talked a little bit about um, just how a lot of students don't really understand that they're consumers of this technology, um, and how uh, we don't really see the technology as something that companies are creating for us, and we see it more as like open source, like everyone is doing this, and so it must not be a big deal sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and I think that that's an interesting point um, when it comes to uh, just teachers just sort of opening the worldview and sort of giving the knowledge that it exists. And even if students continue to sort of have a passive view of that, um, that technology, at least they know a little bit more about it. Um, uh, so I don't know if you have any other points about um, how to break away from the, um, the not knowing about consumer um, uh, sort of work of the product and tech um, with students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that that's what I think, like I think what you just said is what should be the foundation of digital citizenship curriculum, but not in a, hey, look look how scary this is, that Instagram is like using neuropsychiatric data to make you engage more and do more clicks and how messed up that is, even though that's one part of it. But like to, to understand that information, but then to understand what your agency can be within that as a young person. 
I know that there are problematic things about Facebook, and I'm still on Facebook for reasons about former students finding me there. Even though I'm really upset about the network, I'm upset about how data is used. Mm. I understand that I'm engaging in problematic practices at the same time, and we all are in some ways. In some ways, we've gotten to a place where we can't fully extricate ourselves from this. We're not all totally off the grid. But if I position you as a young person to say, I want to give you this information so that you understand the media and digital ecosystem in which you're operating, and then you get to make choices about what you feel comfortable with, or that you, as long as you want to move forward but you know about this and you know what your agency is in that, then I feel like that's a positive way of, of doing digital citizenship instead of just saying, oh my god, it's so scary, there's so much risk, you all just shouldn't be on it. Because we know that youth culture, it, like there's exciting stuff happening online, we don't need to treat it as a total demon or as a savior. Mm -hmm. It's much more, you know, it's in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're saying is the kind of stuff that we need. Yeah, I'm going to stand up so you can see me all the way in the back here. Hi. <laughs> Um, I know this is maybe too big of a question, but I'm going to ask it anyways, <laughs> which is uh, there's for so long, and this feels like, like a century of um, American educational theory has had such great ideas about what we should be doing in schools. You can go back to like John Dewey and all this incredible stuff that we still haven't implemented because <laughs> we keep on getting steamrolled by... Uh, you know, power, <laughs> money, material interests. Yeah. So how do you, mm. you know, sort of try to build towards systemic change while you're also doing the granular work mm. with the individual students? How do you try to, like, manage those two things? Um, because, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's the giant mm -hmm. question for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's our life's work. Everybody in this room are <laughs> educators. That's, that's what everyone's, everyone's, I, I feel like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's Wednesday. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I do feel like one element of it is around teacher education, which is with the, the space I'm in now. I, I felt a lot of um, mixed emotions. I was really um, there are some days when you're in academic world and you're writing or you're and you're like D this doesn't even matter. Like I should be in front of 150 kids every day. At least then you know you're making an impact even on a with, on individual lives. But I do feel like there are different levels of impact, and we all can create impact in the spaces that we're in. And I think teacher education is a really important part of it, because if we can influence the next generation of teacher educators mm -hmm. to think about technology differently, then they all go out and each have their 150 kids, mm -hmm. then we could start building some momentum. And if we create true partnerships where we don't just send student teachers into schools uh, without like consulting, just using the, the placement schools as kind of like dumping grounds instead of actually treating them as true partners, mm -hmm. then we could actually have partners working with universities and with student teachers and creating a virtuous cycle of like inquiry and exploration together. I feel like that's where I see pockets of hope where it feels like it's still going to be moving against the grain, but we, you need to see examples of success to like or of struggle to inspire you. And so I feel like, I mean, you could ask any educator in the room, there's those moments of depends on what scale you're looking on. And if we're always looking at the top scale, then it can be really, really easy to feel powerless and cynical or, but there are different scales at which we could work where I feel like if we keep on like harnessing more of those stories, we could start moving. It makes me feel like that's where I get hope from to keep mm -hmm. doing it. <laughs> so you said something right there as far as the stories are concerned. Um, coming, going from the classroom to the state level, mm -hmm. um, in my own experience, whenever I got to the state, I was like, oh, they have the State Board of Education. I didn't know anything about that as a classroom teacher. Um, imagine if I would have brought my students to these meetings on a monthly basis. You have these in your own, you know, in your own states as well, um, so that the power of story can actually, of, from students, yes, mm -hmm. um, not just us as the educators telling the story, but with students and from students um, can actually help uh, influence policy as well. I think we have time for one more. Yes. How do we help ad tech companies keep mm. humanities in front, yeah. even when they're talking to investors, when they say, that's not the best thing for kids. Mm. To sp I know it might make me the most money, yep. but it's not the best thing for children, or we shouldn't go that rapidly because mm -hmm. that needs time to be tested with children and their yep. families instead of, let's roll it out there, buddy. Mm. Got it. Yeah. It's a million dollar question and I feel like I don't I don't know if the companies can do it without oversight from the public and mm -hmm. from educators and from families and communities because I don't know I'm sure there are I know there are like socially just entrepreneurs that are trying to kind of work within that space 
I feel like we need to know more about those, them because I often don't know like who I could be supporting. We can get boycotts, boycotts going depending on like who we support. I, I think it's, I, I just feel like the public, it has to be like an oversight mechanism because I know that ed tech companies are gonna be looking for profit to survive to their stakeholders above all. Uh, and the investors are looking for profit. And the investors are looking for profit. Yeah. So even if you want to, even if you have a good intentions, you're gonna get kind of swept up in. Yeah. Um, and so I'd be curious to talk to more ed tech folks about how they try to na navigate that challenge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Johnny's got a comment. <laughs> so I think it's that <laughs> I think that going back to what almost everyone said that uh, she you said something like what is okay for kids and I think exposing children to those type of things and a like moderate like pace could work mm -hmm. but I also think that at the end of the day students don't care mm -hmm. like how y'all are recording this right now unless an educator takes this to the classroom how many students are going to pay attention to this mm -hmm. like I know me personally yes I would pay attention because this is something that I'm interested in sure. but if you're not doing something interesting to grab the students attention then no one will care mm -hmm. and I know like I think within social media especially if you want to use that type of platform within a classroom I think you should make sure students use it for what they want to do mm -hmm. like there's a somebody that I know and he's all about sports he plays sports he's a football player but he's like a very horrible person mm -hmm. and <laughs> I think also teaching like social competence within the classroom is very important too because at the end of the day, people aren't smart because of what they know or what they learn. They're smart because of their own experiences and because of basic common sense. Mm -hmm. So I think you shouldn't just worry about like what you put out there. I think you should make sure, like it goes back to equity, you can make sure that it, uh, can't think of the word make sure that it's make sure every student will understand it to who that student is mm -hmm. okay. I like what you're saying about audience right because if this event was truly meant to like get young people engaged it would have to have been designed in a whole different way right and it would yeah. have to been designed with young people at yeah. the forefront because this kind of event is not going to be something that's engaging <laughs> right <laughs> like just like talking heads um, <laughs> so yeah if we're going to flip it mm -hmm. that means we need to start with what young people are excited and interested in, like mm -hmm. you're saying, and build from there. So I think that's an important way to speak, maybe even to the ed tech companies, right? Like youth panels, yeah. which instead of just doing focus groups, but making them kind of more like critical friends, like we keep saying, yeah. that kind of. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much for your time. Mm -hmm. um, because we are among educators who love uh, writing and prompts and reflecting. Uh, before, that's not working now. Okay, well, it's not working. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to transition to the reception. Lisa is going to say a few words, but I want you to think about the I notice, I wonder, and what if. Um, those three prompts as you go into the reception and have some of your conversations. I notice, what, I wonder, and what if. Um, those are three really helpful prompts processing some of this information that you have just heard. Lisa? Yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to just say a, a big a big thank you. We were going to put on screen as well. Um, Sorry. All of you kept over here kept meeting in, in so many great ways. And for the Rabel Foundation and the Van Leeuwen Foundation to make this possible and our whole event series um, is um, supported by them, we'll be having many more conversations like this throughout the next six months or so. Um, and just wanted to, again, just give you all a big round of applause for your efforts. There we go. <laughs>